DCI Music Video, the leader in music instruction and the first company to release instructional music video, brings you the best. phrase and then leaving space and I can hear the hear what the how the drums would fill that in every time you say something so sometimes you uh, if you did you frighten them I think the same thing musically Music video, the first in instructional music video. We set the standard.
Dennis, I want to talk to you about some of the different musical styles that have influenced you. What about the music of James Brown? I started listening to James Brown, you know, at a very young age. I think I was like five, five or six years mm -hmm. old when I first started noticing James Brown and, you know, stuff. And I used to like emulate a lot of James Brown records just to learn how to play grooves or just learn how to play music, period. And there was a few drummers that I, I, I knew or I learned to know, you know, just by their styles of playing, which is uh, Clyde Stubblefield and Melvin Parker. And, uh, I mean, Clyde, I mean, stuck out like a sore thumb to me. So, I mean, he, I found him the most interesting player of, of all the players.
What about some of the Memphis drummers, such as Al Jackson? Al Jackson, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I love this stuff. You know, when he played with uh, uh, Otis Redding and, mm -hmm. and the Booker T's and MG's, you know, well, all the stuff that came over the radio back at that time. Mm -hmm. That influenced your pocket yeah. In playing. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, of course, I got away from pocket playing at a very young age, you know, because of, you know, I mean, I learned how to play music by emulating those records, you know, the pocket stuff. But I learned how to, to uh, I started getting into jazz at a very young age. Mm -hmm. I think the first thing I remember emulating was uh, Dave Brubeck, Take Five, which was With Joe, Joe Morello. Mm -hmm. And then it just went on from there right into, to, uh, you know, Art Blakey and, and uh, you know, Philly Joe. You know, try to emulate. You know, because I never went to school for music. You know, I'm a self-taught musician. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, I got it. The, you know, I had to get it the best way I can, and the best way I knew how to do it was just emulating those records. Because I just didn't know any. I didn't know any better mm -hmm. at the time. And at the same time, you're gigging. I mean, in Modern Drummer, there's a reference that you uh, started working in clubs at the age of six. At the age of six, yeah. I think I was more of a, a novelty act. You know. I mean, I was, you know, this little guy they call Little Dennis, <laughs> who, you know, used to, they used to bring me in these clubs and, and set me up on telephone books. Uh, they used to lower the seat. No, no, they, they, yeah, they put a little chair out and they put little telephone books in it, and I would sit behind the drums and play. 
couldn't reach the uh, I could reach the pedal, but I couldn't reach I couldn't play the hi hat at the time. So I was real good at doing that. And then when the cops come in, they would like yank me off <laughs> real fast. The reason why I, I could get away with playing in clubs because of my mother. My mother was a, a, a singer for a background singer for Motown. So she was a sort of like a celebrity. And that was my sort of okay to go in these clubs to play. I was like little Audrey son. So after James Brown and the, the soul drumming, who would you say next? Uh, Zig and the Meters? Yeah, Zig and the Meters. Uh, you know, I don't know which was first, actually. Well, it had to have been James Brown first, and then came the Meters, I, re I remember now. You know, when I first heard Sissy Strut, uh, that just, like, floored me, you know? Mm -hmm. and, you know, hear this guy comes in and, you know, play, like, uh, you know, this real slick, you know, like, hi-hat thing, you know, he did which was really unheard of back then. It was before P Pretty Purdy played his Hyatt thing on Rock Steady, you know? Uh, I mean, the open and close Hyatt thing, and, right. and with the backbeat being the way it was, uh, I just fell in love with that.
Harvey Mason uh, when he was with the, the Headhunters. Mm -hmm. Just floored me. I mean, those records, you know, the Head Chameleon, uh, it was just amazing. Some right. of the stuff he played on that stuff. And, you know, just great, great plan. So these were kinds of milestones in the evolution of funk drumming. Yes. And I saw Billy Cobham play, you know, from that moment on, I, I wanted to play fusion. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, here's a guy who played a right-handed setup and played a, a left-hand ride cymbal, or had his ride cymbal on the left-hand side. When I saw that, it was just something new for me, you know. I uh -huh. never seen anybody up until that, that moment or until that time, I never saw anybody do that. Right. So a new challenge. It was a new challenge, you know. So mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I, I jumped on it right away. You know, so everything I learned how to do with my right, I had to go back and learn how to do with my left. Uh -huh. But then later, uh, you know, I learned that, uh, you know, people look at that like it's showing off, so to speak. So I just drop doing a lot of things with my left side or try to play everything I would do with my right, try to play it on my left. I just stuck to my right. And uh, I think what happened was, uh, you know, later when I joined P-Funk, when the percussionist left the band, um, I took all his gear, you know, and put it over to my left side of the drum kit. Uh -huh. you know, that, and it was all stick percussion. There was just two timbales, a whole bunch of cowbells, and, and like a few cymbals, various of cymbals, and other little things I could hit on at the time. Mm -hmm. So it came back. You know, I started playing a lot of stuff, with, or leading with my left, you know, because I had to play percussion with my left hand and play the drum the kit drum with my kit. right. Uh -huh. Which was time. easy to do, actually, because, I mean, for the, for the drum part, because George wanted, all George wanted was a solid bass drum playing four, you know, playing solid fours, and you just crash on the one with the, every other one with the, the uh -huh. cymbal, the crash cymbal. Uh -huh. But you've also got 20 musicians on stage to worry about and horn hits. And yeah, yeah.
Parliament Funkadelic or Funkadelic music had a heavy influence on, on my mm -hmm. funk plan. Mm -hmm. I think that's actually when I learned how to play with a rhythm section. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, because up until that time, you know, like with the fusion music, you know, I mean, you, it's about playing with each other there, but, right. you know, you really, you know, I mean, you know, you're in, you know, you're playing a lot and you're not really listening. I mean, you're listening, but you're really not listening to what's going on around you. Right. At least when, you know, some of the musicians I grew up playing with, playing fusion music at that time, that's what that was about. But I, I uh, when I joined P-Funk or Parliament Funkadelic, you know, it was 20 guys and it, and it had to sound like 20 people on the bandstand. So w how old were you when you joined the band? 18, 18 or 19 years old. I think it was like 18 years old. And that was your first major uh, touring act? Yeah, it's funny. I, you know, here I am in, you know, just out of high school, playing in jazz clubs, you know, playing a lot of jazz music and a lot of fusion music. Next thing I know, I get a call to, uh, or I get a plane ticket to, to come down to, to Atlanta, Georgia, you know, to start rehearsing with the band. So. And you know, the, the next night after that, I'm at Madison Square Gardens. <laughs> you know, it was pretty wild. Mm -hmm. I remember, like, you know, the, the lights would go up. And I look out, and there are all these people. I never seen that many people in my life. You know, <laughs> and I look down, I have like all these goosebumps, and you couldn't hear, you know, because the people were like cheering. You couldn't hear when you count off. Mm -hmm. So I would count off, and everybody, the band is like, "What? You know, what's going on?" You know? <laughs> so I had to like yell, you know, like real loud to count off the tunes. You know, playing with P-Funk was a great experience for me. How long did it take before you really felt comfortable in that band? Two months. Mm -hmm. it, I felt comfortable in, you know, like being with the band, but I never felt comfortable playing the music until like actually like three years. Mm -hmm. three, yeah, about three years after I joined the band. You know, all the way up until that time. I mean, I spent a long time playing a lot of jazz fusion music, you know, and uh, I mean, you know, like funk, so to speak, but, you know, P-Funk or Parliament Funkadelic is a whole different type of funk thing. You know, all your life you, you, uh, you know, you listen to a band that you, you know, you really idolize for, you know, like in your early, earlier years and all of a sudden here you are playing with them. Mm -hmm. I never dreamed that I would be playing with those guys. So this period of nine years had a heavy influence on what you've done since then in terms of uh, the groove and the foundation and, and the pocket. Can you talk a little bit about how that developed and some of the uh, George Clinton ideas? Yeah, well, one thing I had to learn was like how to play in the pocket. And I didn't know what that meant because no one explained that to me, especially in, in that organization mm -hmm. until later. You know, I, I uh, finally broke down. I was like, man, what, what, are you, what are you guys talking about? You know, like, what is pocket? You know, and what it meant was, okay, well, you, the time is here. One, two, three. For you can either play right on those beats, which George didn't want. He wanted to lay back a little bit, you know, like behind it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that's what he meant, you know, with, you know, putting it in the pocket. But you could still feel the time being where it is. It was just, you know, you still had this heavy or this little sluggish feeling uh -huh. type of thing. But was the hi-hat? The hi-hat hi stayed on, stayed you know, on. the time. Snare drum. Yeah, I mean, sort of like what Gad does with his left hand. You know, when he plays snare drums, it's it's like some of, some of the stuff he did with Steely Dan. You know, some of those uh, examples were like this. You know, snare drum was like behind the beat, so, so far to speak. Back. You know, just, yeah, a little bit laid back, and that's pocket plan. Mm -hmm. That's what George called pocket plan. So that would carry on into the record dates you're doing today, whether it's sequence music or not. It all still applies. It still applies, but I, I don't have a, I don't get a chance to uh, do those type of things anymore because, you know, usually, you know, guys want you to, you know, uh, I work with a lot of guys who, 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 who work with these sequences and they want it to be exactly right on the beat, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, as soon as you try to lay it back a little bit, you know, they, you know, they think, you know, like the time is like a little weird. Right. And all you're trying to do is just, you know, like trying to create a comfortable vibe on the track you know human feeling yeah but the only the only time i really get a chance to to exercise those type of things is like when i'm playing live with the rhythm with the rhythm section Thank you. 
parts that you and Gary came up with for Blue Matter, I mean, they're very unique. And they're very uh, locked in together. There's a lot of patterns that are phrased together between the bass and the drums. How did that all come about? Well, as far as I remember, it was, you know, John brought in this tune, you know, you know, just had like, a, you know, the chords, chord changes and, and the accents. Mm -hmm. We started playing a groove, you know, which wasn't the groove that was on the record at the time, but it was like a, another thing. Right. And, and then all of a sudden I started playing, you know, like the triplet thing, you know, which is what I learned from listening to Tiki Forward. You know, Gary played, a, you know, he had a bass line, you know, he was like, he changed his bass line to fit what I was doing, mm -hmm. you know, and then it came in, it, it came about, you know, like he listening to me, me listening to him, you know, because there were a few things I had to change to fit his thing too, right? You know, so, and, and that's how it, you know, just how, that's how it evolved. And John just let it happen. He just let it happen. That's the great thing about John, uh, right. you know, when you play with his band, he, he don't like really tell you what to do, you know, he just... Mm -hmm. Bring in some music. I mean, if he don't like what you do, you know, he'll say, okay, well, you know, I don't right. like this, you know, why don't you try this? But that was just very seldom he would do that, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I just remember, you know, like he just always just brought in these tunes and he was like, well, here's the tune. Right. Here's the accents. You learn the accents and the rest, you know, you got it. You guys uh -huh. got it. He just trusts us to do those type of things, you know. It haven't been that way since. I don't, uh -huh. I, I can't remember it ever being that way since. Mm. You know where 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 you know where if you're in a band and and the the, the band leader just lets you do what you what you do he trusts trusts you to do what you do. Mm -hmm. so it's just like somebody saying, you know, here's a a sketch of a painting. You know, put some color to it.
you know, a lot of people think, you know, when they hear those triplets on the bass drum, they immediately think that I got that from John Bonham. You know, it's because probably that's where the, they first heard it from. But for me, I, the first cat I ever heard do that was Tiki Fullwood, you know, with Funkadelic. And the second time I heard it was with John Bonham. And John Bonham made it famous, so to speak, because everybody was into, you know, rock music right. and, you know, that kind of thing. Another time I heard that that triplet configuration was done by a guy named Diamond, and he was the drummer who played with the Ohio players. Mm -hmm which he demonstrated some things like this. Of course, the tempo was a little faster, or the tune was a little faster than that, but right. he made a landmark with that, you know. And then I came along and did it. We've talked about drummers who influenced you throughout the 60s and the 70s. I'm interested, uh, when was the first time you heard uh, Vinnie Kaliuta? I, uh, I heard Vinnie when I was with P-Funk, and the first thing I remember, remember hearing uh, was the Joe's Garage record. And when I heard that, I was totally blown away by his plan. I mean, today I have, I have various different, you know, influences. I mean, from, I mean, a serious range, you know, from the jazz, from the, from the fusion, from the funk, from the, you know, pocket. I, you know, just have a big variety of different influences. Uh, Marvin Smitty Smith is one of my favorite drummers, you know, today, you know, bebop, his, his bebop plan is, is amazing. I mean, so, in his, I mean, his other things that he does, you know, like the groove stuff is pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeff Watts is another one of my favorites. Tommy Campbell is one of my favorites. Um, you know, Weckl is one of my favorites. Gad is one of my favorites. You know, Billy is still one of my favorites. Tony is my favorites. And there's one drummer I like to mention that uh, not too many people, there's two drummers I like to mention. I don't, I don't think people know anything about them. Uh, one drummer is this guy named Gary Husband, who plays with Level 42 mm -hmm. right now, but he used to play with Alan Holsworth. Uh, he kind of reminds me of, when he plays with Holsworth, he kind of reminds me of, of Tony. Uh, another drummer is a guy named Mark Mundesier. And both, both of these drummers are from Britain. Mark Mundesi is a, is a phenomenal bebop player. There's Will Kennedy also, who plays with the, the Yellow Jackets. I love the way he plays. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a whole bunch of guys, you know, a whole bunch of guys around New York, you know. Um, right, I think every time you're in town, you're at a different club every night. Yeah, I make it a point, you know, out. I make it a point to just go and just check out people. Another guy I, I, I always fail to mention is Lenny White. Just the way he tunes his drums and his approach to, to playing the drums is, it's, you know, I'm just really knocked out about, you know, by his plan. And Jack DeJeanette, mm. you know. Mm -hmm. You know, those are my favorite players, including the old guys, you know, with, with, with right. Max and Elvin and right. Philly Joe, Papa Joe, and Big Sid Catlett, you know, uh, Louis Belson, mm -hmm. who I had a chance to play with. You know, I still have to pinch myself on that. You know, <laughs> can't believe I actually, you know, shared the same stage with him. Mm. You know, that's one of the things I'm impressed about is you seem very open-minded about taking in everything. I mean, you mentioned one day Joey Barron. You know, that's a whole different side of jazz. He's a, another one of my favorites. When I go see somebody like him, you know, I kind of wish that I, I, you know, never played drums. You know, because this guy has such a beautiful approach to playing, and I wish that everybody just thought about 
or had the same approach as this guy, you know, when he plays, you know, such as, you know, when Lenny plays and Joey and all those other guys, you know, I, I, it, it makes me go home and, and want to, like, just, you know, you know, think about, well, maybe I'll go into another field, another area, take another career. Mm. And it's it's weird, you know, because they, they, some of those guys share or they express those feelings to me. And I'm like, man, get out of here, you know. 